Hello everyone. Back again with film recaps. Welcome to Freshly Recapped. Today, I'm going to recap the movie, There Is Someone Inside Your House, a movie about a killer in 3D printed mask on the loose in Osborne, a town in USA, murdering people using their secrets. Enjoy the video and watch out for the spoilers ahead. The movie begins with a shot of Jackson, a football player, driving to his farmhouse in the middle of sprawling cornfields, as he curbs his pickup truck outside and crashes into his bed. When he wakes up and steps outside to leave he discovers his pickup truck has gone missing. Trapped inside the house by himself, when he calls police for help, he discovers there are pictures of him assaulting his gay teammate, Caleb. He follows the trail of pictures laid out neatly for him and steps inside his room, where inside the closet, he finds more pictures of his teammate dripping in blood. As he lashes wildly, a hand appears from under his racks of clothes and cuts behind his ankle, making him fall on the ground. We see a man donning a 3D printed mask of Jackson come out from behind, and as he bends down over Jackson he stabs him in the chest, killing him. The killer then picks up his phone and messages the whole town a video of Jackson harassing Caleb in the showers, in the middle of a football game, and as Caleb stops celebrating his goal he finds the whole town staring at him. Next day, in the middle of the whole school mourning the death of Matt, as Makani leaves a get well soon card on his memorial, a recently transferred student from Hawaii, we see a bunch of her friends, Darby and Alex join her in the morning, as we come to know the whole school is now blaming Caleb, the gay teammate for the murder of Matt. Later in the cafeteria, while discussing the possible suspects, Jack throws his dad's name in the mix as he figures who else will benefit from the death more than his dad, who will now buy the house at a dirt cheap price, as no one else would want to live in that house. They call Caleb over to their table and ask him to join them. A girl, Caddy, then takes a stand on the table, and as she thanks Darby for giving her strength, we come to know Darby's name is Justine and now identifies as a male. Darby is embarrassed for being doxxed in this way. As everyone closed their eyes in prayers for Caleb we see Ali looks at Makani and she looks back at him. Outside, Jack finds his car sprayed with a graffiti and seems not too displeased with it. He asks them to join for a smoke as they all step inside and smoke it up. Back at home, Makani worries about her grandmother and asks her to drink the tea for her condition of sleepwalking. And when her grandmother asks her to let go of her past in Hawaii and focus on her studies Makani tells her anyone can know about her past by googling her real name. The grandmother reminds her that's not her anymore. Later, Makani scrolls through her pictures with Ali as she remembers her short fling with him during the summer break. As she goes to sleep, Ali messages her. In the middle of the night Makani wakes up from her sleep to find her grandmother sleepwalking again, as she asks her to skip the church service tomorrow. The next morning, we see Caddy is alone in the church preparing for the funeral service of Matt. She thinks Marcus, her classmate, is there with her. Suddenly, an audio podcast begins to play on the screen above her, and shows her talking about how gender determines intelligence, and men have higher intelligence than women. However, she finds whoever was with her is now gone and she is all herself alone in the church, as the masked killer who is wearing a 3D printed mask of her, shows himself. And as she tries to run away the killer goes after her and cuts her down, making her fall on the floor. As people begin to gather outside the church and find it locked from inside, panic begins to ensue. Inside, Caddy crawls under the benches and tries to hide inside the confession box. But the killer fixes the knife on one side of the box and pushes her hard from the other side, sinking the knife inside her mouth, killing her. As the pastor comes and unlocks the door to the church, they find the body of Caddy handing from the ceiling with blood all over her body. As the news begin to spread about the killer on loose, the police imposes a citywide curfew and announces their plan to begin investigation from Osborne High School. Later we come to know Makani's full name is Makani Sunwoo, as she googles her name. Next morning, they all gather inside the sheriff's office for the investigation. As they wait for their turns to go in, they begin discussing various people in the room as suspects. But Jack tells them that the police themselves could be suspects as he informs them about a referendum to dissolve the police station and replace them with private security next week, and how if they solve the crime and blame a non-white person for the crimes, they will be heroes overnight and will save their jobs. Alex then looks at Ollie sitting in the corner, and starts suspecting him as he has no friends and has a tragic past. Just then an officer walks out and informs Zach he is free to go and his father is waiting outside to take him home. Outside, his father gets angry at Zach for turning up for the investigation when he should be out of Omaha on a plane. And when he smells marijuana on him, he is furious for showing up high in the very place he is trying to shut down in the next election, as he asks him to clean up the graffiti on his truck as it is embarrassing for his family. Later, as the only two of them left at last, Makani and Ali find one of the police officer, Chris, who is also Ali's elder brother, is missing his taser. 
as they both leave and drive together, and make out in the middle of the curfew, they come to know about a secret party thrown by Zack at his home while his father Big Sanford is away. They arrive at the party and find the whole school is there and sharing their secrets with each other. As Makani joins them Zack shares how genius the idea is, if they all share their secrets with each other, the killer will have no ammunition to use against them. When Alex finds Ollie staring at them she asks him if he has any secrets to share with them, but Ollie walks away. Darby then tells her secret to everyone that he has been selected for fellowship at NASA, and Alex tells everyone she has fallen in love with Rodrigo, and Rodrigo tells them his secret is same as Alex and that he has fallen in love with her. And when they ask Makani for her secret, she tells them her secret is that she writes poetry, and Zack tells them he is about to fail school. But Zack does not stop there and pulls out a Nazi gun. He tells them his secret is yet to be told, causing everyone to panic. Sensing the tension in the room, he asks everyone to calm down. But he puts the gun in his mouth and pulls the trigger, and to the relief of everyone in the room, breathes out smoke. He then introduces them to his father's Nazi memorabilia, the tenth largest in the United States, informing them he has converted most of them into hookahs and bongs, as he begins to hand them out to everyone in the room. Zack then proposes a toast to burning the Highway 420, along with one percenters, planning on burning the world down just to stay warm. As the party kicks into high gear and everyone gets high on marijuana, we see Rodrigo take his painkiller pills. Alex and Rodrigo make out inside a room and when he comes out he finds his painkillers are scattered on the floor, and as he picks them up people begin to show a clip and question him about his secret. The power then goes out. And as everyone begins to panic, we see a masked man wearing the mask of Rodrigo inside the room. Now in full panic mode, everyone begins to run away. We see the masked man goes after Rodrigo, running in the opposite direction of everyone else. Soon, as he runs away from the house, the masked man shoots him with a taser gun, incapacitating him as he falls in the fountain. The killer then grabs him and shoves an entire bottle of pain killers in his mouth and slashes his throat with his knife, leaving his body floating in the fountain. When the school reopens again after three weeks everyone tries to move on. However, Alex blames Ollie for the murder, as we find out she is not the only one. During the game Alex tries hard to convince Makani the murderer is none other than Ollie, as he is the only one with a deputy for a brother and with access to everyone's private records. Zack also points out how Caddy's podcast was also anonymous, and only police can request connection logs from the ISPs. But Makani walks out, not believing them. Next day, Ollie shows up at Makani's door and asks her for a long drive to an ocean. When she points out that Ocean is hundreds of miles away from Osborne, he shows her a tape. Soon, they arrive at Sanford's farms and trespass into his cornfields, and Ollie shows Makani an ocean of cornfields, as they step onto their car and look into the horizon ahead. Makani then goes on and recites a poem on how time is all a fleeting moment and forgets everyone and everything. When she asks him if he is the murderer, Ollie jokingly tells her maybe that's why he brought her in the middle of nowhere, where no one can see them. But when Makani tells him he has to know her secrets first before murdering her, Ollie asks her why she thinks he does not. As they kiss each other, Ollie gets a call from his brother, and Makani is shocked to find a taser inside Ollie's car, and puts it back before Ollie gets back. Inside the car, when Makani asks him about his family and how they died he tells her they died in a car accident, but people made up stories about their deaths being results of some psychological problems, telling her how people always look for someone to blame in such situations. And she, with her own history, would know that more than anyone else. This comes as a surprise to her. And when he tells her she knows what's being blamed is all about, she asks him if he ran a background check on her. Seeing Ollie with no answer, Makani steps out from the car and leaves him. As she walks away, Ollie calls her by her real name, Makani Sunwoo, and tells her he knows who she is. But, Makani does not look back and walks away. Later she takes an Uber and returns home. But before going to sleep, she locks the house and the room down and takes a knife to her bed. In the middle of the night when she wakes up from her dreams, she finds her door is ajar, and the knife is gone too. She runs down and tries to call for help but she hears the recording of her own voice on the other side. Walking into an adjacent room, she finds the pictures of a half-burnt girl all over the wall and a newspaper story about a student burning down the beach on the floor. As she bends down to pick up the paper, we see the masked man through the window outside. When she turns around and sees him, he shoots her with a taser gun. Now inside, the killer, donning her face mask, sprays her face with gasoline, then drenching her body with it. As he takes fire and is about to burn her a car passes outside, distracting him with its headlight. This gives Makani a chance to fight back, and she pulls his leg, making him fall. Just then, we hear the voice of Alex, looking for Makani, making the killer run away from the spot. 
As Alex calls for help, she finds Makani blaming Ali for the attack, telling her how she was right all along. Alex also discovers Makani's secret, lying on the floor. Later in the night, she wakes up and finds herself surrounded by her friends, who tell her the killer has messaged everyone about her secrets. But, Makani tells them what happened in Hawaii. As she narrates her backstory we come to know she was part of a sports team in Hawaii that were, one day, taken to the beach by her senior teammates, where they got everyone drunk and tried to turn them against each other, and it was in the middle of all this ruckus she accidentally pushed a girl named Jasmine into the raging bonfire. Back in the hospital she tells everyone Jasmine survived the incident with burn marks. However she was charged and acquitted. But threats continued. So, she took her mother's maiden name and moved to the mainland to get away from her past. Darby tells her she is a different person now or why else she would proofread her essays and be so kind to her and even stand up for her in public. Alex tells her she even tried to help a murder like Ollie. Soon, the vibe in the room changes to one of love as they hug out each other. Ma Connie, back at home, sees Ollie being arrested for the crimes in Osborne and thinks about calling Jasmine, but backs out at the last minute. As the town tries to get back from the recent spate of murders, Big Sanford throws a big party for the town in the middle of his cornfields and invites everyone to have fun, and promises the event is protected by his private security and there is nothing to worry about. As Ma Connie waits for a ride to the party, she gets a text from Darby informing her Ollie has been released from the custody. Just then she sees Ollie arriving at the school and runs away from him. Running through the hallway, as police asks her for what's her emergency, she crashes into Caleb, and is grateful to run into him instead. But someone stabs him from behind. And as he falls away, we see the killer wearing Caleb's mask now, who approaches Makani and to her surprise, hands her his knife and steps away. Ali arrives on the scene and administers first aid to Caleb while others begin to arrive too. Makani is too shocked to move as she stares at the poster of the corn maze event, holding the knife. In the middle of festivities, we see the killer arrive at the corn maze, put on a mask and enter into the maze from the restricted area. As the bus loads of people begin to arrive at the event, the masked killer wets the fields with gasoline. Not too far into the distance we see Darby, Alex, Ollie and Makani driving to the event as they check on Zack and Caleb, and come to know Caleb is out of danger. As they discuss who could be the killer, we come to know Big Sanford has taken almost everyone's land in the area, including some of the police officers, whom he is trying to shut down too. The killer then sets fire to the cornfields, seen by everyone in the car. Makani then gets a call from Zack who asks them to stay still and don't move as everything is on fire at the event. As the killer moves into the smoke, we see them arrive at the spot, as the fire rages everywhere around them. Makani asks Ali to drive through the fire and clear the way for the people still inside, not to forget their own friends. Alex agrees as Ali pushes the pedal and crashes into the flaming fire, as they forge ahead Makani begins to envision her pass through the fire. The car then thuds to a stop and everyone comes out. Ali sees a knife in Makani's hand and runs towards his car as everyone tries to stop him. But he takes out his taser gun and joins them. They hear cries for help and decide to help, asking people to follow the path behind them. As people begin to leave Makani asks Alex and Darby to go back and help others on the way and tells them they still have to find Zack ahead. Moving ahead they find dead bodies on the ground and stumble into an argument between Big Sanford and the masked killer, now wearing his mask. He begs him for forgiveness, and reminds the killer he has a family. Makani calls him out. But the killer does not wait for her and stabs Big Sanford through his face, killing him. He then goes on cursing himself and removes his mask and we see the killer is Zack. Zack tells them he has been dreaming about this moment forever, and how you only get to kill your dad once. Ollie tries to stop Zack with his taser gun but finds it jammed and Zack stabs him in the stomach. Turning to Makani he reminds her none of this has been easy on him. She tells him none of this is him, and he needs to stop now. But Zack warns her she does not know who he is, and she does not even know who she is. As Zack rants about denying himself the benefits of being born into a privilege, all these years, and why he should feel guilty of who he is, he reminds Makani how everyone is wearing mask, addressing her by her real name now, and how everyone has that benefit. But he has no other choice, but to live with his last name. Zack then tells her he is only showing people who they really are, behind their masks. Makani threatens him not to step one step forward. But Zack asks her what she will do, if she will throw him into fire too like Jasmine. He then blames her for killing Jackson, Caddy, Caleb and his dad with the same knife in her hand, as he reveals his plan to pin all the murders on her, and how he had no choice but to kill you for saving himself in self-defense and no one will ever know. Just then Ali wakes up and shoots him with his taser gun but misses. But Makani steps in and stabs him with a knife. As he falls down, 
Makani calls him deluded for thinking having everything makes him a victim and how he is wrong in thinking everyone else has the problems, when he is the one with real problems. She then asks him to look at her as she reminds him she does not need to wear a mask to show him who he is and stabs him through his heart, killing him, all the while fire raging around them. Makani then goes to check on Ali and breathes a sigh of relief finding him alive. As she apologizes to him for everything, the sirens in the distance get closer. The movie ends with Makani reciting up a poem of hope and remembrance, as we see Ali and Makani get married, Caleb gets accepted into a university and Alex into a musical school, Darby decides to join NASA Fellowship, and Makani makes the call to Jasmine to ask for an apology. If you make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you can watch more videos like this. Thanks for watching.